Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, here's a quick heads up to save the date, December 1st through 4th, for our Thriving Farmer Summit, Value Added. If you're looking to add income to your farm with simple, proven strategies, go to www.farmsummits.com and drop your email. Our summit series have been viewed by over 100,000 farmers and get rave five-star reviews. In this summit, we'll share detailed strategies for farm ferments, herbal foraging, tinctures, pickles, farm kitchens, foodscaping, mushroom jerky, and mushroom kits, developing add-on shares for your CSA, how to publish books with your farm story, starting your own USDA processing plant, and starting a farmer co-op. Over 35 speakers are sharing their wisdom. Go to farmsummits.com to reserve your spot today. Steward is transforming agriculture by equipping regenerative farms and food systems with the capital they need to grow. As a mission-driven financial partner, Steward works closely with agriculture businesses to scale their operations, improve the health of their lands and waters, and boister farm-to-regional food systems. To date, Steward has provided over $15 million in business loans to fund 75 unique projects backed by more than 1,500 participating lenders. Steward is proud to be a certified B Corp., Seek financing or support a loan campaign at GoSteward.com. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael here with another episode of the Thriving Farmer Summit. And today my guest is Jeff Bragg. Jeff, in his own words, he is a, I am a lifelong agriculturist from hand artist, furrow irrigation expert since birth, to consulting agronomist, to product development and chemical inputs, to VP of a large multinational corporation as a product developer of potatoes and alliums. A change in health led my wife and I to leave corporate agriculture and get into regenerative organic only product development. We work with the Lord's methods of photosynthesis and rotational regenerative agriculture. We are here to help grow local farmers for superfood potatoes. Our career started yesterday, November 10, 1979. It was our 43rd wedding anniversary. So that's what he's saying is 43 years ago, yesterday, they started their career because we're recording this on November 11th, 2022. So uh, help me welcome Jeff to the podcast. Thank you, Michael. I'm excited. I love, I love the, I love your voice. I love your passion of what you're doing and it's uh, an honor. Oh, thank you. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, you've been a long time in agriculture done a wide range of things. What was it that, you know, got you started in the farming? Well, it just so happens that our farm had the first earthen dam on a canal system in the western United States in Idaho and so we had the first reservoir system and canal system pre any other states in the nation Uh, the gentleman that built our canal in Snake River is called we were on the north side canal company the north side of the Snake River Mm. and uh, it was the same gentleman that helped build a small canal through Panama called the Panama Canal and oh, he, okay, and he also was the actual father of the potato industry. Although in Idaho, they'll tell you it's the guy that invented French fries for McDonald's, but it's actually Joe Marshall. <laughs> and Joe Marshall uh, uh, went back to the Chicago ex- Exposition with great big uh, russet Burbank potatoes. The russet Burbank was what made Idaho famous. And uh, he took it back there to the Chicago exhibition and to Chicago steakhouses. And that's how Russet Burbank became the household name of the famous Idaho potatoes. Awesome. So then talk to me about growing up and with that new canal system, what did that make possible? Well, the new canal system, and this would have been in 1909. Um, my little, my little German grandma Bragg, she actually cut sagebrush down taller than her. She was about five foot tall. She had, mm. uh, immigrated in from St. Louis, Missouri, where her dad worked for Anheuser Busch in the 1800s. Um, my, her, her family to be the Braggs, actually, uh, my great grandfather was a, a reverend, a Methodist reverend from Diamondale, Michigan, 
and he actually moved out uh in the first their first uh, land that they actually homesteaded was north of where we where the dam was up in a place called sun valley and it's where marilyn monroe uh, filmed the show bus stop okay but then she and then she ended up, he, they ended, he had tuberculosis and passed away and moved into what was used to be former Lincoln County in Idaho, which is now Jerome County of Idaho. And so I grew up uh, with this canal system that had been made in the uh, ninth, early 1900s. And uh, we didn't have pivots. We didn't have sprinklers. We didn't uh, have drip tape. We didn't have anything, but what we had was the natural curvature of the earth and furrow irrigation to match up with the contour of our soils. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for folks that may not understand furrow irrigation, talk us through a little bit of how you set it up. Well, it, it the way we set it up when I was about five years old <laughs> was we would take a V-shaped uh, blade and just make a V-shaped canal of your ditch, if you will, and take water mm -hmm. from a measured head gate because uh, Western water law is first in time is first in right. And then you, uh, we actually adjudicated our water in Idaho, but what Western water law is what dictated how much water came out of that head gate to your ditch to where you could then make with a, with a horse and a, pl a V shaped plow just to dig to where the water run into it. Mm -hmm. And then from there we would use what was called the beginning of my, was feed ditches which was just off the bigger ditch you cut a slot out for the uh, slight angle downward so water could flow and you would make that water flow yep. to meet and meet to meet the crop and we worked on 22 to 30 inch uh two, 22 to 30 inch and 36 inch rows uh be 30 22 inches for beans mm -hmm. uh, we raised, uh, we were the valley that made beans famous for places like Green Giant with our Blue Lakes beans and yep. things like that. And uh, actually, uh, sugar snap peas were developed in our county. Uh, hosts of hosts of seeds. We were known as a seed growing area until it's now just a GMO area. But you just, we just mm. had water trickle down to the end of the furrow and it get down to the end of the field. And that ditch would go into the next parcel of land and to that contour, and it may go to a different angle and things like that. So we yeah. did that, and that's how I grew up until the 70s when uh, Earl Butts uh, stated his famous uh, quote, get big or get out, mm -hmm. which, which caused the complete failure of American agriculture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So with furrow irrigation, you have to have pretty level fields. Is that something that the valley was known for, or would you just you level the fields before you started planting them? You leveled them, and then you just had feed ditches to gradually yeah. go over. It. And uh, I remember my dad then, uh, all of a sudden, about 1972 or 73, when Get Bigger Get Out came in, all of a sudden I noticed something happening. Uh, they, these people from another country south of the border were all of a sudden in our in our farm with a trailer house next to it. And I was uh, curious who these people were because I'd never seen uh, Mexican workers before. Mm. And so I went down there to see who these people were taking over my shovel irrigation job. <laughs> and, yeah. And come to find out uh, they became my extended family uh, now, and I love Mexican and Latino people because of meeting them. They did give me a hot pepper to try to get rid of me, but I became a chill head. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so share a little bit about, you know, as you grew up, how did the industry, how did the farm change? Oh, it, you know, when I reflect back on it, Michael, it was probably the best thing that I ever, best time of my life when I remembered it. I was not going to be going into farming. Uh, as I, as you said, I became, uh, we became farmers on our anniversary date last, uh, on 1979, November 10, when we married, mm -hmm. it was the day before that, when my dad got me back into agriculture. So I'll just tell you on that day, I let him sign my marriage license and he told me I'd be good for this new company that he'd hired to watch potatoes. And it was the first soils lab in the United States. <laughs> okay. 
and that's uh, so on the day before I married, he put the initiative in there, and somehow my wife and I, after marriage, became uh, a couple promoting agriculture through both of our careers, mm-hmm. and uh, we're just getting right. We're getting right after it but the way it changed michael is that you uh, first of all i started meeting the first dairyman that ever had they came from california and our county commissioners had uh promoted the idea of the dairies coming in and we were famous for dairies too we had dairy gold as a cooperative in our town when we were when we were growing up with our 13 head of cows but uh i saw that happen and that we saw also, I think the biggest, the first knowledge to me of what the dairy industry was going to do to the valley was about in 1974 when we went to the first carousel dairy milking station in the United States, and we we never thought a lot about it. But I graduated in 1976, the bicentennial year. Eighty some percent of us were farm kids. Mm. And uh, right now in the county I'm from, one to two percent of the of the high school would be farm kids. The rest of them would be migrant workers' families. Wow, that's crazy. And that's so changed. what I saw was a change. And uh, first of all, it went from furrow irrigation, and then it went to uh, get bigger, get out. Then we went to sprinkler. Yeah, so we went to the hand lines. Dad said I would like the hand lines uh, better than the shovel. I weighed 88 pounds, pulled, three, pulled up the first pipe that was 40 feet long, full of water, three inches around, trying to move it 50 feet to the next location. When I, my feet got stuck in, up to my knees in my irrigation boots and I couldn't get out of them, and he was telling me how easy it was going to be. And I told him, I said, this isn't that easy. Uh, I left for college. I was going to be a geological engineer. And then my dad talk, talked uh, me back into agronomy to be my life. Uh, like I say, when he signed my marriage certificate. And uh, so we ended up in southern Idaho from Moscow, Idaho. We, I met my wife, Sandy, in a uh, Western swing ballroom dance class in the University of Idaho. And uh, we then moved down to the farm where I did an internship with the soils lab while we were going to college at the University of Idaho. And uh, it was quite a journey. That's, uh, that was when my first poisoning happened was when I first started taking soil samples and potatoes in 1980. Mm, all right. Talk to me a little that bit about that. It has a lot to do with sprinklers. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Because all of a sudden I changed from furrow irrigation to the knowledge of sprinklers. Then I, then I, it was, it was a change, Michael. It was uh, all of a sudden this was in, you know, and I, I wasn't going to farm, but I was. And so I took it in wholeheartedly and I met two of the greatest mentors in my life. F. Todd Trembley was the name of the gentleman that uh, uh, was, is in the West Washington State University Hall of Fame as a soil scientist. And his son, did his master's degree at Utah State University and uh, Tremblay Consulting had the first lab in the United States. They were the most accurate. They tested for accuracy for their analysis. And they taught me that I was never supposed to prescribe anything as the master of a court of law because the only insurance we could get as consultants at that time was from Lloyd's Mm -hmm. of London. And so it was uh, quite a deal. Uh, it took me off guard though. My first daughter, Danielle, was being born and Sandy and I, I was taking soil samples in onion fields in western Idaho and potato and grain fields in eastern Idaho and also in the Magic Valley where I'm from in the south central Idaho. So it was uh, quite a change. So all of a sudden the, the hand lines came in and then the hand lines left because Uh, We were sending our kids off to college more than we were to farms. Mm. And so then you saw the immigrants come in to change into the, uh, to the system. Uh, The town that I have, that I grew up in has 57 Mexican restaurants in the town now to support the eight or 10 dairies and the two potato farming 
families that are left that have that are actually uh, huge families with a growing in there. It's all uh, we've lost in Idaho. We lost from uh, 2,000 to 3,000 over over 3,000 Idaho potato farmers lost. Wow, we were wiped out by NAFTA. You were wiped out by NAFTA, and so that's when all the production went south. All the production went south. I was on bargaining boards for the Potato Growers of Idaho. Uh, potato Growers of Idaho was an entity set up to be a to set up our, and to represent Idaho potato farmers. We actually negotiated French fry contracts with uh, Simplot, Nestle's, Lamb Weston, Conagra, and I was on bargaining committees. I was on uh, educational committees to study how oligopoly was going to change our world. And I also uh, was the founding secretary of something that would come back later in my life to haunt me. Uh, I was the founding secretary of the, of the Snake River Potato Growers, where we wanted to do a field to fork among potato growers and not with mm-hmm. big companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I set worker safety laws in place during that time, was on the food safety boards, uh, where we didn't want it to slow down the use of chemicals. And then I gradually saw over the course of the time, the lockstep agriculture that it created. Mm, mm. What was the moment when you just, you realized that you needed to make a change to regenerative agriculture? I always was in regenerative agriculture and rotational agriculture because my dad had 14 crops and three or four herds of different kinds of livestock. So we raised all types of different crops beans, peas, lentils, alfalfa. Uh, we did the first grass seed and canola, uh, you name it, uh, malding barley, feed, silage, and potatoes. But uh, when I probably saw that, what really changed me was in 2012 as the vice president of product development for a green giant fresh company And I was going out to a field where we had seed and I was walking out to the field and uh, the the prescription analysis was is if you found one aphid in the field, then you were to spray for the aphids that create a virus called potato virus Y, which we never had until we started putting all these chemicals on, by the way, I Mm. never, we didn't have it. It was not my vocabulary when I took my first potato class 40 some years ago, but uh, it was right sunny morning about 10 a.m. and I looked down and I saw something on a leaf that I'd never seen because I'm a leaf nut when I'm scouting potato fields. And I saw a tree frog sunning itself on the potato leaf. And I went over and took the leaf off and took the tree frog out and put it in the pasture next to the potato field. And then I went back and uh, started the chemical pump or the chemical ran through the center pivot that then runs the insecticide through the water to kill all the insects in the foliage knowing full well that i was killing that wasn't the only frog in that field Mm. and that was my last application of any pesticides was in 2012 and i left a corporate role after bringing uh, i also found out i had it was a kind of a tumultuous time for my wife and i from 2010 to 2013 Uh, I was uh, was asked to give a talk on the glycemic index in Holland in the Netherlands at uh, the largest breeder in the world. And then in the course of doing that, found out I was type two diabetic. Mm. So, and a potato developer. Mm-hmm. So then, then I, that changed my whole thought process of uh, what I should be doing when I was given a carbohydrate load on food nutrition. And so I was given 35 grams of carbs to eat as a prescription three, day, three times a day with 15 grams in between them. And uh, so it was seven and a half grams, I believe at the time for a teaspoon of ketchup, which means I could have a meal with seven or eight teaspoons of ketchup. Mm. I looked at the organic model of the, same, of the same companies and it was half the sugar at that time because it didn't have high fructose corn syrup in it. And so that's what turned me away from that. And then as far as the genetically modified foods, um, I worked with a company that was uh, building the Flavor Saver Tomato, if you've ever heard of it. Mm-hmm. 
I was one of four individuals that worked for that company. So I, that was, I don't know why I've been big companies <laughs> uh, while I'm still wanted to be a farmer. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'm very, I don't mean to be interrupting you. I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, very uh, passionate. Yeah, no, no worries. It's not you interrupting me. It's the latency of the connection. So it's not a problem at all. The ed- the editing will clean it out. Um, so yeah, no, you just keep going. I'll just try to, you know, pop a, a comment in or as we go. But no, this is fascinating stuff. Um, but yeah, so just keep sharing your story. And then we'll eventually, I think, find our way to talk about, you know, the work you're doing with potatoes. Okay, well, my wife and I, when I was on the road for this big company, I was uh, on the road 140 to 150 days a year, if not more, uh, running, packing, uh, making, uh, putting safety qualifications in, prescribing uh, pesticides and fungicides and everything over all of our because That's what I'd been taught after... I went away from the family farm model that we were on. And like I say, we decided, my wife and I, that uh, when you wanted to be together more than being apart, she was a, she ran uh, human resources for very, very big potato companies, one of them multinational. And she was in the human resources. And she also, uh, uh, when I first met her, was that we, we met and she was at the Ag Economics Department at the University of Idaho. That's how we met. And, but it was our passion to keep moving forward. Why we decided in 2013, I sold my shares of the stock that I owned. And my wife and I went to degree after NAFT is forced to stop the farming. And down to California, where I, for two years I, after that, I left my wife and kids in Idaho in, in January 2000 and went to Stockton, California, where I ran a uh, red, white, and yellow potato operation and asparagus uh, growing and packing facility. And so... We were there for two years in CIF, and so I applied for it, and Sandy and I moved our family out of Stockton, California, back to the University of Idaho, where I finished a master, and then my went right into a master's degree program, and it was on intellectual property rights. My thesis was on distance education, but my main topic was uh, reinventing the potato. Mm. And so how many years have so you been working in, in potatoes? 2000 and uh, I wrote that in actually in 2001 and 2002, reinventing the potato and uh, well, I started uh, unprofessionally. Well I, well, I was the cultivator guy and the furrow irrigation, five, six years old, uh, just shoveling for him. <laughs> and then about 11 or 12, I started uh, being the cultivator for my dad and his neighborhood partners. So I cultivated them. Then I didn't want, wasn't planning on doing that. But then in 1979, when I married Sandy, uh, we actually then got heavily involved. I went down and did my internship in 1980. And uh, then uh, they sent me back to college working for them. And uh, then it went forward to NAFTA. Uh, NAFTA took us down there to, to California and, and then back to the University of Idaho where Sandy went back to the first job that she had when I met her in 1979 at the Ag Econ Department. And I went into, uh, uh, I was a director for the ACIF program where I found Idaho farmers living in front of their houses and vans and so we all had to we all had to get new jobs because of how many of us went out of business Mm. talk a little bit about the work you're doing now with potatoes i I know you've been talking about you know some of the interesting ways you're you know raising them you're doing some tissue culture talk us through that well potatoes uh one book for everybody to read would be michael polon 
And Michael Pollan wrote a book called The Botany of Desire about the four plants that changed the world. And that was tulips, potatoes, apples, and marijuana. And mar marijuana, not for the reason why most people would think, but marijuana's uh, growers actually invented tissue culture. And that's mm -hmm. where plant genetics came from out of the Davis, California area. So they invent new uh, plant genetics, took the, what the marijuana growers were doing and introduced tissue culture into the seed industry of the potatoes. So most of our, all of our potatoes now, 100% of them worldwide are come from tissue culture, which is growing them in a test tube and then into four by four pots in a greenhouse into potting soil. And then, and then uh, that's a clean seed because it, they can test for the, from the maristone tissue to get it clean. Mm. And so I, I planted the first clean many tubers in the world with plant genetics and it was called new spud and then it's now wine grapes and fruit trees and everything else are done with tissue culture but i uh, had a disease that i was working on in conventional ag as a product developer that would never go away and it was a disease called uh, silver scurve black dot complex and i don't know michael if you've ever seen any graying of red potatoes at, at a store when you go look at them they're they're not bright red but some of them are gray uh-huh okay well that graying is silver scurf and and black dot it's colococcum cocoides there's two diseases there yep mm -hmm. been well familiar with those okay well the fungicide that was being applied to take care of that, I was prescribing seven to eight times a year as a consulting agronomist and product developer. But come to find out, I couldn't get rid of that silver scurf and black dot until I went to organic. When I started growing them organic and all the seed came from non-organic, even all organic seed comes from non-organic beginnings because they don't buy the mini tubers from tissue culture. They're called pre-nuclear mini tubers. And so that the graying that you see even in organics is because of that very first year where it's not organic. Uh -huh. And it's a, it's a resistant fungicide, it's called fluidiodinil. And if you put a COVID and pesticide search together, you will find that a, a gentleman at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison and a Russian scientists have both found that the pro the fluidiodinil, fluidiodinil, I might be saying it wrong or spelling it wrong, but it's in that COVID, if you look at COVID and pesticides, but it says it's responsible for glutathione in the human gut, which is our receptor that builds immunity to diseases. Interesting. So that's, I, since I stopped using it, we are planting and have planted the only mini tubers that have ever been certified organic. And they, uh, we've eliminated that disease. And when you, we eliminated that disease, we found out that the stems didn't die either. And so they kill potatoes now with various means, whether it be uh, chemicals or sulfuric acid in Idaho, or, well, it's better than what they used to do when they were using Agent Orange and diesel fuel, but yeah. Um, I was, I learned how to roll potatoes before I ever did that. And so yeah. rolling potatoes killed as well. We killed them at our farm. Yeah. We would flame and, them. Yeah. And flame them. But now we're, now we just uh, let the, we roll them and let the, all of the energy potatoes, when they start senescing, that's when most of their bulking occurs. Okay. Cause they, the tuber, the tuber is a sink and it takes everything out of the, out of the, the vines down into the down into the uh, tubers. Interesting. So and that that's how last, we get the, that last little bit is when they're going to do majority of the, the 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 sizing. Yes. Plus, they're also a root vegetable, so they're taking everything in the soil that's gone up into the leaves, mm. and all our nutrients are then going back down into the tuber. Interesting. And that's why they're a superfood. Gotcha. Okay. So talk a little bit about the superfood status. Why are potatoes so good for you? Because potatoes are so good for us. Number one, potatoes saved Europe. 
if it wasn't for the Spaniards taking potatoes to Europe, there would be, we would not have had the United States be the melting pot of the world. Potatoes are what caused the melting pot of, of the world. When you go to Europe and you go to a potato meeting, uh, for example, uh, Parmentier potatoes, you'll see in restaurants sometimes. Parmentier was a liaison for the King of France as they were going through a problem with wheat. They had uh, smut and other diseases in, in your carbohydrate source for nutrition. And so they were eating, they were eating primarily uh, uh, just breads for their carbohydrates for survival. Mm -hmm. So ones like the Irish found that they could live as in, in the Prussian prison. And then he came back to the King of France and said, you know, for the last two years, they've been, they've been giving me nothing but potatoes and provide not five off of them. So, King of France actually, Marie Antoinette, Marie Antoinette actually wore flowers, potato flowers, so people, the peasants could see her with these flowers. They then planted a garden that allowed the peasants to come in at his arm armed all day long and at night they take the armed guards away and peasants would come out in and they spread potatoes through France. Same thing happened in Russia. Same thing happened in Poland. Same thing happened okay well i always uh, my dad said to buy the best seed and then always look for the better seed mm. and that's how i approach seed of any crop so to me in potatoes the thing about organic potatoes the first thing that conventional industry is going to do is point fingers at organics for being a problem because no one spray them and so i find that quite the opposite now that i've quit I actually see that there's more natural resistance to pests than I ever knew before. And so my favorite health food, I want to change the world of uh, French fries and snack foods to where people can actually eat them. One of the things that people don't realize is this. This is a fact I learned in potato science. The rut that Burbank made Idaho famous, but if it fell below 45 degrees, the French fryer would not take your potatoes if they were in storage and fell below 45 degrees. If they fall from 45 to 38, it cre creates it between a two and 400% increase in glucose. Mm. That's, that's why they're deemed unhealthy. And all of the fresh potatoes are held at 38 degrees for long storage, along with a sprout inhibitor to keep them from sprouting. Gotcha. So, there's 17 layers of chemicals in potatoes at conventional. So, okay. So then talk us through then what the, 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 the chipping industry then wants them uh, fresh, right? I mean, that's what they, they're looking for in their potatoes. Well, mostly fresh, but chipping potatoes are stored at 50 degrees versus 45 degrees. Part of my role has always been, though, being a potato scientist to begin with, with potato science classes for part of my career and afterwards. Um, and that is to do scientific tests to find their usage and what you can use them for. And then I've also uh, worked on t cold tolerant temperatures to where that don't matter. So we can actually have give a safe product without sugar to people. And by the way, I was type 2 diabetic in 2011, and mm. I gave the talk in the Netherlands where I brought a low glycemic potato back from the Netherlands to our company. Uh, they then shelved it. Mm. So they left it going in Canada, but not in the United States. 
and uh, the glycemic index, uh, they're actually now working on taking the glycemic index out of the medical vocabulary. Interesting. And so me being a type 2 diabetic, between 2011 and 2012, I lost 90 pounds. My, I'm five foot seven. I'm now five foot seven and 160 pounds versus five foot seven and 245. I went from an 18 and a half inch neck and my arm's short too. So I had to take double extra large shirts and have them tailored to fit me. Mm. And I went off all diabetic medicine in 2015. And I no longer have been taking diabetic medicine now for seven years, but the, it's upset the industry uh, quite a bit. And so I'm actually looking for cold temperature fryers and long shelf life and potatoes with rich colors that are full of flavonoids, anthocyanins, lutein, and carotenoids. Okay. So talk to us about your development results then. Oh, my development results, is kind of, it's really interesting. Um, I, did, I actually saw the varieties before I went to corporate America. I actually saw the varieties. I went on a Land O'Lakes and USAID. Uh, you, have you heard of USAID? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. I went on two USAID missions into Siberia. Okay. Where, uh, where I saw three of the varieties that I would come back to two of them. I would come back and lead the company with the two varieties they had. And I'd already seen them before I ever went to work for them. Mm -hmm. So to date, I'm over 60 potato varieties of different kinds in the business, frozen food and the fresh and side and baby potatoes. Uh, most of the baby potatoes, new red purple fingerlings and things like that. Um, I put into the world. So I'm very mm -hmm. proud of reinventing the potato. And I we also did nutritional composites of it, uh, the potato, and there's widely ranging nutrient density. And so I was also the chairman of the Potato Association of America Utilization and Marketing Committee. My last official talk as a chairman was to actually bring people together. And we talked about... Uh, we talked about the potatoes mm -hmm. and we, so I actually uh, ended up putting all these market classes together and then started breeding company to go along with it to, so we could control the, the scalability of what, what we were doing with the potatoes to begin with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now share a little bit about like, um, so do you sell the varieties then or are they available through different uh, suppliers? There, most of the ones I've developed a lot of them that uh, people haven't uh, put into the market yet. So breeders send me seed from all over the world. I've got seed right now from the government of Chile through a, a pro professor in North Dakota. Uh, I've got uh, universities that send me things, and I've also my wife and I have also actually also worked with uh, botanical seeds, true potato seeds, uh -huh. instead of instead of planting the eyes. So we've okay. actually did the first first marketing downtown San Francisco of true potato seeds. Uh-huh. Now that so, true potato seed does not breed true, correct? Is that it actually, like that's how you get new varieties, correct? Right. And it, so this is really interesting, Michael. When I was uh, went to work as an intern for that soils company, we were told by the, the big magnets that own the the French fry industry and the uh, fertilizer industry, he told that company told us we needed to not have any flowers showing on our plants. And the only way you can get true potato seed is to have flowers that get pollinated. Mm -hmm. uh, I never saw any berries in my conventional world that ever were pollinated when I was putting chemicals on, but in the organic world, our potatoes are profuse, profusely flowering, and we are developing new varieties. It, when you get a seed ball, it looks like a tomatillo or a green tomato on top of the plant. Uh -huh. And that 
that each there's between 50 and 75 seeds within those seed balls. Every single seed in the seed ball is different than the parent underneath the ground. Wow. That's how much diversity there is in potatoes. They didn't want us to know that the fertilizer company. So I asked the question in 1981 and that to the potato professor that uh, his name was Dr. Willie Aritani. And he was world famous with potatoes uh, and with a concept called physiological aging to where he could increase or decrease the size of the potatoes due to how you age them. But he, I asked him that question because I'd been in, in the internship program taking samples in 1980 and, and 81. And he told me that, uh, he says, potatoes will flower if the wind blows too much. Potatoes will flower if they get too much nitrogen. They'll flower if they don't get enough nitrogen. They'll flower if they're, they're supposed to flower, basically, is what he told me. So yeah. now, I, now I encourage it. And I put a viral video on on my LinkedIn account in back in 2017, and I went into a field, an organic field, never had any compounds on it in Oregon. And uh, I heard a strange buzzing as I was uh, just looking at it before the seed inspector came to see it for clean seed. And I heard this noise, and what it was, it was the noise of humming uh, uh, of honeybees pollinating the flowers of this variety and it ended up with thousands of berries it was so deep that i could fill a five gallon bucket within a foot radius in this field mm. there was that much diversity so probably a million berries there's probably 75 million different varieties potentially in that field wow and I put it on uh, LinkedIn where I got 5,000 views plus from Bayer, Monsanto, DuPont, a few other companies that absolutely did not like it. Mm. I left it though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I never saw anything like it. And there's praying mantises in it. And then you got, so here you've got bees actually uh, working in a potato field, which kind of blew people away. Beekeepers didn't even know it. So now it's common for us to see hummingbirds even in potato fields, in flowers. Interesting. And so that's, I'm kind of looking into where I want to do, let nature be the breeder mm -hmm. and not have man temper it. Although I've set up two breeding companies for two companies, one from Europe and one for the United States. So I'm very familiar with greenhouse work and everything. So we're, what we're doing now is we're working on a, we're working remotely to stay out of uh, people's way, and we are clean, using get clean soil, clean water, and we're and we grow them two spec because of some labs that actually aren't totally connected to each state's uh, seed associations. We yeah. really people really don't know that we don't have seed in the United States. Joining me is Dan from Steward, a mission-driven financial partner for farms across the U.S. Dan, farmers typically look for funding in a financial partner when they decide to scale their business. Why is that? Farms that are scaling, that's a farm that's dialed in their products, their markets. Now they need to grow their production. So they need equipment, they need land, they need labor. They need all the pieces to really scale up production and meet market demand. That's when capital is really needed for farms. Prior to that, farms can use limited funds and tend to get their business going. But once they've established their market, it's about raising funding or having other resources that can help really scale the business. Um, in a lot of circumstances, we've taken farms that you know, had been small operations and really helped them grow to get to where they hope to be. One good example is Fisheye Farms in Detroit. They were farming on a tenth of an acre lot, an urban farm, and we helped them fund two acres of land, wash and pack station, equipment, utilities, water, and that whole system system let them grow from about 10,000 revenue to over 150,000 three years later. So where I see the real opportunity in regenerative agriculture are these farms that they've got their production going, the demand is really in place, and how can they get the resources then to take the next step and get the business to the viability that it can be. Yeah, originally it's like they've got the proven model, the proven idea, and they just need that little extra to help grow it. And I think it's important to talk about how the model at Steward works. Give us a little bit of an overview of what the model looks like when you when they go out for funding. 
So steward, the difference between steward is that we fo focus solely on regenerative agriculture, funding these types of farms, and the funds are raised through our platform from individuals who are making contributions to the loan that we make to the farmer. So the steward was built for accessibility to broaden who's able to fund agriculture. By changing who can fund it, it changed what types of products can be available to farmers, the types of financing that's out there. So it's about aligning the financing with the needs of the farm. And in particular, for these types of farms that need to grow and scale, you need the right type of funding. You need to give them the time to, to grow the business before having to make payments. And so the, the kind of flexibility around uh, designing for this type of farmer is really what Steward was built for. Mm, absolutely. If you are looking for a non-traditional mission-driven financial partner who understands the business of regenerative agriculture, reach out to gosteward.com today. Now, you also mentioned that there's going to be a shortage of potatoes. Talk to us about that. Well, the continual lack of rotation, uh, I'll just get the famous potato growing state of Idaho. They probably won't be happy for me to say this, but I will say I won't eat one. Okay. Um, I know all the compounds that go in them. Uh, now, I'd eat, my, I'd eat my two friends that raise organic potatoes, but most because they've only been organic potato farmers mm -hmm. to begin with. Everybody else that does organic throughout the United States in the potato industry, it is it's just a, a way to, to try to control every market. Um, so I'm I'm not much into that, and I definitely don't believe in gene editing. So mm -hmm. I I was I worked for the first company that was doing it with a flavor saver tomato, and they seem to have never forgot about that. And my wife and I are kind of like commerce disruptors when it comes to genetically engineered food. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, and you said because of lack of rotation, there's just going to, they're not getting the yields they used to. So there's going to be a shortage. Yes. And then they've also, uh, well, here's what's happening. You, you see all these chemicals now for new biological controls to introduce the biology back. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you look up a product called, uh, Vapam, V-A-P-A-M, Metam Sodium, I worked on that compound, and it is a biofumigant. And you know what a biofumigant is. Mm -hmm. bio, bio means life. Fumigant means death. That means anybody or anything will die if you come underneath this gas. Well, it ended up, uh, uh, we started with those canal systems. We can now have potatoes going over the canal systems on bridges, pumping chemicals on it into the water, even that we used to formerly ditch irrigate. Really? Yes, and I put the first application of this product on Vapam. It's uh, it is the uh, uh, it scares us to death because the first day we put it on, to, before it was labeled, I was thinking in the back of my head, I just hope that people don't use this as a as a crutch instead of a rotation, and that's exactly what they did. So every other every other year they plant potatoes in Idaho and there's zero rotation. Uh-huh. Gotcha. What are 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 the amount of potatoes being grown organically increasing? Are we seeing a change in that? Uh I would say comparison to conventional, it it it's lax. It's uh, hasn't changed. It's just a matter of a hand of a few that hold them. No one's trying to increase the use of uh organic seed so i actually presented for the organic seed alliance uh this spring and i intend to try to set up organic laws rather than uh, around potatoes rather than uh having a having a conventional industry run it um there the metam sodium just came out last year too vapam as the leading cause of cancer in the western united states really wow so, so, so if, if folks wanted to get some of your varieties, where would they uh, go? Do you have any specific varieties that you'd recommend that we kind of, uh, folks start with? I, you know, I would, I would uh, start with, I would start with heirlooms for most people because some of the heirloom fingerlings that that had people surviving in the 1700s are the first potatoes that, uh, that that sell out every year because people still know their heritage. And these are Russian banana 
and Austrian Crescent, and mm-hmm. uh, there's one of they them are breed bred about the same time, almost looking alike as fingerlings. The other thing is, is I would recommend to people growing potatoes to look for organic as as clean and organic seed as possible, and recommend having them get the North American Health Certificate that tells where they were grown originally and where it told it tells every year of their life because you can increase potatoes from the first year of tissue culture up to seven years it's called a limited generation system and the reason for that is because you're carrying soils and things from one place to another um so where to get see where to get and see last year idaho seed actually a, a lot of it came from maine because of the potato virus y that i mentioned earlier and uh, so they brought in potatoes from Maine to Idaho to raise potatoes this year. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Now let's talk a little bit. I know a lot of people grow potatoes and I know that people don't get the yields they want. They're a little frustrated by that. What would you say some of the key things to think about with like growing potatoes would be to make sure you're getting the, the potential out of the crop? Okay, the biggest thing, Michael, would be to uh, assess the field of the soil sample first. I, and I do a soil sample, 0 to 12 inches and 12 to 24 inches, and I also do a nematode test along with that. Okay. And that to uh, make sure that my nematode doesn't uh, show any nematodes it would carry into somebody else's, and it also tells me the nutrients and everything in the soil. But... To be honest with you, it's the quality of seed that you buy is the number one impact of what you can do with potatoes. I mm-hmm. am very on the year of the best seed. So we, like my dad said, find the good seed, find the better seed, and then look for the better seed. And so mm-hmm. I would tell them, know where their first year source is. Because in the organic certification, you have to, you have to, you can buy organic seed from somebody. And it's organic, even though it was produced the first year, or set two years, or three years conventionally. Because mm-hmm. people that sell normally it's three to five years after that greenhouse year is when they sell it to the to the general consumer or the pe- people that have organic uh, small parcels of potatoes. So what I'm working on is to actually uh, grow growers from an apartment mm-hmm. all the way out to the sea. And then one of the biggest thing about potatoes is people have a tendency to over fertilize and over water them. Uh, potatoes are eighty five percent water, so they're very susceptible to heat and water. It's better okay. to let them grow and get uh, you know how you uh, condition things in in greenhouses and things is the same with potatoes. Mm-hmm. So then. Condition. They have to condition. Now, is that conditioned as you are, as they're, as they're being put away or conditioned uh, before you store them? It's conditioned all season long. So I, what I do for organics is I, uh, I make sure we have good moisture at the seed level, which is approximately eight inches deep. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's about three to four inches from level after you put the, after you perform the hill while you plant it. So your hill might be six to eight inches high, but you're still three to four inches down deep and you're into, into the sub moisture. Okay. So what that does, potatoes grow in the dark. Mm. So they don't grow in the daytime, they grow in the dark. So they, they will grow as long as they're in moisture, they root up an inch and then down about four inches on each side of the plant and they root down to three feet. And so I let the, the seed get rooted down. And as the soil dries on the top of the hill, then that allows those two, those stems to come through, to come through, uh, uh, they, they, to come through dry soil. The stems will come through dry soil. They, they prefer not to have wet soil on the stems. Okay. And then a lot of people will water in the heat of the day and they'll water the foliage. And if, if you don't do it the right kind of irrigation, you can actually smother the soil, causing a vapor barrier in the soil and heat the, heat the potatoes up. But potatoes set due to nighttime air temperatures. Interesting. And then too much fertilizer 
or nutrients actually keeps them from senescing. And that's also uh, directly related to bulking and sizing of potatoes. Okay. So then, all right. So then we want to be, so it's preferable to water with like drip irrigation. So you're not getting the leaves wet. Uh, drip, drip works fine. Or I prefer it for bigger fields with people who pivot. I, I don't, I don't have any love for pivots that are automatically run with a computer anymore. And so, and in desert soils where most of the potatoes that I work with are grown, pivots don't help me. Solid set, and particularly I'm looking at the new type of solid set called uh, yellow mime, where you, you're you actually putting a sprinkler for every, you're not moving it, you're laying it down for the season. Yeah. I did a lot of, and then I do a lot of furrow irrigation, but yellow mime is the big thing for that. And I would go to furrow because furrow actually fills your reservoir of your soil up which then you don't have you, which we're not, then we're not evaporating it into the atmosphere. Gotcha. That makes sense. Now, um, how many hillings do you recommend? I only hill once. Okay. And, and so when the potatoes come up through that dry soil, the weeds aren't germinated because the potatoes are coming through. And then just as 85 to 90% of the potatoes are coming through, I like to throw soil up on top of the plants with dry soil, that is. Yeah, and then have a pipe behind the cultivator that drags off the top flat because a wider hill lets heat escape equally. Okay. And I and I throw two to three inches of dirt soil. I don't like to say dirt soil over the over the leaves of the potatoes. As long as it's dry soil, the potatoes then two to three days because they grow in the dark will come through that layer. Okay. And then I and then I water the potato. Then has got all the roots gathered up to take up the space for weeds and then you water mm. and then you then you figure out the evaporation rate know your water holding capacity and uh, and watch the weather to make sure you're always trying to run cooling water if you need to because nighttime air temperature sets the tubers so you may actually use water just to cool so that you can actually set tubers better yes and that happened this summer uh, i had some folks that were not they weren't weren't irrigating at night with the drip, but they were irrigating in the daytime, and they were irrigating it too too much in the daytime, and it was uh, actually steaming the plants, which causes fungal and bacteria issues. Okay, but now what's the uh, where you're located? What's the daytime temps? Happen? We're located uh, right now. We're in a cold snap that all just a sudden came through, so we're just letting soil warm back up. But normally, uh, potatoes love 85 to 95 degree daytime temperatures and 55 to 60 degree temperatures at night. The wider the spread, the better they are. And I've grown potatoes at nearly every elevation, including below sea level up to seven or 8,000 feet. Okay. Okay. And then... Um... Do you ever pre-sprout potatoes or do you wake them up or do you go right from storage into the ground? No, I actually uh, only plant whole seed now and I only use uh, human hands that put the seed into the tray that puts it in the soil. So I believe in human electricity. Okay. I, I, do, not, I do not cut potatoes anymore. They don't cut them anywhere but the United States. <laughs> Everywhere else they, they plant whole seed because of diseases caused by poor rotations yeah. over time. And uh, the other thing is, uh, is uh, just monitoring and looking ahead for the weather and knowing how much, knowing when, when to water, but don't overwater. Because then late in the year, their potatoes have little uh, white spots on them called lenticels. Mm -hmm. Potatoes breathe just like humans. And so they're breathing. Uh, as they're as they're growing interesting yeah i've definitely seen those white spots and wondered what that was um yeah they can be a bacteria spot for a lot of people they'll they'll keep watering and the plants wilting but they're actually they're trying to the tubers are site if something happens to the plant the plant will reabsorb tubers to grow again if something happens to the tubers the plant will regrow <laughs> interesting Interesting. Yeah, and they 
they they breathe when you put it when they put it they're not like corn or wheat or anything else that are dry for two months they're they go into storage and they're breathing the whole time yeah 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 okay um and then at the end of the season um because obviously like when we were trying to we would kill vines we'd either like flail them off or as we said flame them off but you're recommending just let the vines naturally die as much as possible yes leave them in fact i roll them I prefer to roll them. Okay. If I need to, it seals the cracks. So we don't have greening. Yep. And then at the same time, it sent the biggest yield increase I saw as an agronomist taking field samples during the year for yield analysis was the week after any application or our vine killing method was used like rolling. That was the biggest increase I saw in yield. Interesting. So you want to do at least a week. All right. It 18, well, yeah. It takes 18 to 21 days to mature, no matter what you use. And so I'm looking at, but this, like I say, we don't have silver skirt from black dot anymore. So organics actually takes longer to mature because the plant still taking more nutrition. Yeah. 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 So then you also mentioned too much fertility. Um, yep. What so what's the levels that you recommend? I mean, we're running a mixed organic system. We don't do a ton of potatoes, but and I know a lot of people don't do a lot because they're typically not a huge value for them. Um, and uh, so if I have like a well-balanced soil, I've got my phosphorus, potassium just kind of hanging out. Um, what do you recommend for like additional for that? Or is it just always going to come back to the soil test? You know, it's interesting. I take soil tests now just so I know the levels so I can learn, mm -hmm. but to be honest with you, I haven't put enough nutrients on, put in an eyedropper. In fact, we call, I guess it would be called photosynthesis is what we're using. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I call it the large way because it's photosynthesis. We don't, we don't go and fertilize the trees in the forest and they're growing just fine. And so I've learned and it, it was a real hard pill to swallow if you will because you remember me talking about that one tree frog and then yeah. killing it for the one aphid well that's that i the first year my wife and i grew seed you have to have it winter tested and i set up the winter test with my wife over in hawaii actually that all the seed growers send their crops over there in the winter to check for uh any viruses before they sell them to the next customer we were on the way over the first year to look at 25 varieties that we'd planted and as many tubers. And we were worried sick about the readings of this potato virus Y and we didn't have any readings. Huh. And we didn't, we didn't have any readings any of the years we've been doing it since then. <laughs> so you're saying a lot of the problems the potato industry is having is actually self-caused because of the amount of just uh, death, death uh inducing substances they're spraying or treating the potatoes with absolutely absolutely i found that uh shelf life is better it was actually uh with potatoes that, that are handled organically i see diseases like uh, fusarium go away black dot silver skirt vanished i still have intact i still have potatoes intact out here even though we're waiting for it to warm back up because we had a Kind of a cold snap come in so we're just waiting for the warm soil to, to come back again and uh i saw something this year i they've lived 60 days longer than they should just waiting for the time to be right for their conditions and they were these are organics that should be they would in a normal conventional field they've been dead in 85 days we planted uh -huh. them in june and we're still waiting for them to be mature because there's they're still trying to do their thing Okay. Now the rollers you're using, I'm assuming they're a specific potato roller. That's more of like a, a cone kind of cut off a bit there that just rolls around the whole hill. No, I, you know, actually, no. It, what we do is we built it at our own farm when we were, and when we were IPM growers, my, yeah. my wife and I, we won the EPA National Potato Council Stewardship Award in 1999. And so we were trying everything not to put anything on, even though we were at that time 
IPM. I never did like conventional. Yeah. But we we put a pipe and we put uh, truck tires around it so we could cover four 36 inch rows. Okay. And we put these tires around the uh, this pipe and then we put pillow bearings block bearings on each end and uh, I used it I could fill it with water and had plugs in it so I could fill it with water if I had a heavy clay soil and I needed to get to yep. snap the and I use it I take water out for sandy soils so that was big big four row planting uh, so I'm into two okay so, so then the potatoes the, the the tires would run right on top of the hill and just push down the plant Yes, and you do it at early in the morning when they're when they aren't because uh, if you did it in the afternoon they they become uh, uh, in the yep, morning they're yep. turgid. Yeah, so it would it actually kind of it probably probably breaks the stem a little bit, but still leaves it attached, so it can still suck the nutrients back down. Yep, now through the phloem and xylem. Yep. Okay. Okay. Now you and, mentioned you're doing a two row potato plant. Talk to us about what do you do for two rows. A two row potato planting, 36 inch rows. They make these the down at Home Depot. You see those little tiny yard rollers people uh -huh. used to make a lot. That's, that's what we've used. Okay. We've so even, you're just doing it simple. Yeah. And then we've even used a four wheeler tires and gone over the top of them. I noticed when I had solid set, we used to raise about 300 acres of solid set with our 1,100 acres of potatoes under circles. And we would, uh, we would, uh, I'd drive along the stakes where the solid set would with a four wheeler, and that'd be my roller. And I found out that worked as good as the heavy roller. So, even for small growers, a four wheeler tire uh, set on there is almost perfect to roll over the top without damaging potatoes. Uh -huh. And I've, de and I can, I've, draw, I've got some mock up drawings so I can help anybody with any size of, uh, I, I just like helping people so I can help them with that. Uh -huh. I, I've, uh -huh. got, I've got simple designs I could send you. Yeah, no, we'd love to see that. We could even add it to the, um, even add it to the uh, blog post. That this is going to go on on the website. So people could just go over there and check it out if you wanted them to. So, yeah, well, all right. Well, this has been fascinating. I have learned so much. Um, is there anything else, um, Jeff, you wanted to chat with? And again, we could obviously have you on for another episode at some point. Is there anything else that you wanted to share before we go? I just want to share to, that, that let food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. Mm. Because I, I was in an organic potato storage. Most people don't know that the compound that keeps them from sprouting was actually turned, was actually globally taken off the market two years ago because of cancer causing agents. And so uh, let food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food and do not uh, follow grass at the USDA or FDA level. Do you, have you heard of grass, G-R-A-S? No, I have not. That's a term called generally regarded as safe. Oh, yeah, okay. Yep, yeah, okay, now I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, that's that sprout nip went off the market without a single consumer knowing that it had been causing cancer for four, for four decades. Wow. Wow. People complain about the high cost of organic food, but they don't complain about the high cost of cancer medicine or they're like, Oh, well, that's just what it costs. And like the cool thing was, well, you never need to get cancer to begin with if you had been doing organic from the start. Yes, and it's interesting. The reason I'm up on a soapbox anymore, Michael, is I got poisoned in an organic, uh, quote unquote, potato storage in New Mexico in, in November of 2020 because of my exposure taking soil samples to all these chemicals in my in, from the 80s. Interesting. So, poisoning well, right now. What is the what? What was the exact thing that you got poisoned by? Uh, it's organophosphate, but the product was called Thymet, and uh, they use it now on conventional seeds. It's a seed coating called Thyram, T-H-I-R-A-M. Thyram is a derivative of Thymet, 
and that's what went through my as I was taking soils and uh, samples right next to the seed where it was put in with a uh, with as a dry charcoal looking stuff that smelled awful. It went through my fingers and then taking petiole samples on potato fields, and so that's when the poisoning occurred. And then I got into this year uh, old potato storage that we'd scraped the dirt two inches deep, we'd sprayed disinfectant on the walls and everything else. But a condensation event within the storage r- went up to the ceiling and rained down, and I'm checking potatoes in there. And then that when I, that thing that my the guy told me in 1981 or 82 that I would had organophosphate poisoning of, of th- thymate thyram, I I asked him when it'd go out of my body, and he said never. And that was way back when. Well, now Beyond Pesticides and Farm Aid has helped me, and I've um, I had lesions all over my body a year ago from wow. an organic store. And wow. I still have them. Yeah. Have you gone to someone that can help you like do detox? Yes. Uh, Beyond Pesticides sent me to a woman from Tehran uh, that lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, she said she'd never seen anything like it, but she knew what it was. Yeah. And so she, she gave me the cleanse and I if I eat six potatoes of the from a French fry place that I know of, I get sick. Wow. Um, and we can actually bleep this off the air, but who was the name of the woman in New Mexico? Uh, I, I can't think of her name. I, I don't have it on the top of my name, but she's, it's been a year ago uh, that she saw me. Yeah. Um, we, I go to someone that thinks is in Arizona called Jane. Does Jane ring a bell? Uh, her no, Jane, but I've heard that name because somebody, somebody got a hold of me and uh, somebody yeah. got a hold of me, told me about Jane, and I'll get her name and I'll send it to you. But she was from Tehran and she said that uh, what I got came from Wuhan. Uh huh. Interesting. And I, and knowing the people, the chemical companies as well as I do, yeah, uh, I'm. They're one and the same. Big pharma equals mm. big pharma. Yep. 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 Big pharma with a pH and with an F are pretty much the same. Yep. 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 I don't care. You know, and I don't, you know, Michael, I've, I've been called a commerce disruptor, my wife and I, and we've been told to quit and everything else. And well, we aren't going to. Yeah. And yeah. I work talk about organic seed and I'll have links. I'm working on getting seed out of the ground right now, organic. We've grown with an organization and it promotes, it promotes, they believe in promoting health and they believe that uh, the end is near if we don't change our ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with you on that. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate you coming on today and sharing your story. Um, And uh, we'll, we'll try to have you back at some point, but uh, this has been fascinating. I learned a lot. Um, I'm going to change how we're doing potatoes. Um, it's interesting to hear what you say about that. And um, we uh, appreciate you sharing your time with us today. And I'll let you know when that seed's available because we're working with Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. And, oh, awesome. Uh, yep. So we're we're all in to help the environment. Yeah. And I love this. I love getting this uh, off, of my, off of my chest, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. And thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful day. All right. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, Thriving Farmers. Here's a quick heads up to save the date, December 1st through 4th, for our Thriving Farmer Summit Value Added. If you're looking to add income to your farm with simple, proven strategies, go to www.farmsummits.com and drop your email. Our summit series have been viewed by over 100,000 farmers and get rave five-star reviews. In this summit, we'll share detailed strategies for farm ferments, herbal foraging, tinctures, pickles, farm kitchens, foodscaping, mushroom jerky, and mushroom kits, developing add-on shares for your CSA, how to publish books with your farm story, starting your own USDA processing plant, and starting a farmer co-op. Over 35 speakers are sharing their wisdom. Go to farmsummits.com to reserve your spot today. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer Podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.